Hey, I took a wrong turn at two minutes to my commute. I'm like, oh shit. I my, my neighbor told me to ask
invitation to your friends and then we have uh, folks from Fort Dodge that came down for this. Uh, Luca, uh, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. He's seen a number of presidential candidates and he might make a decision soon so I'm, I need your help in this. You might be able to influence your dad too. Uh, but thanks for joining us. And uh, I want to 
start off by saying this. Uh, we, we got a, also a birthday gentleman here. Uh, Brett is the chairman of the party here. He's been on CNN. He's the mayor. Uh, and so thank you for uh, being here today. And happy birthday to you. I will tell you, he's just, he's very young, all I can tell you. Uh, but you, whenever you look at this race, I said this six months ago, that this is the most unpredictable political environment in our lifetime. And if you know exactly what's going to happen next year, make sure you put some money on that. But I don't think many people know what's going to happen next year. And so, and you can illustrate how unpredictable this is uh, because we have six candidates that have bowed out of the race and, uh, and they're suspending their campaign. And so, uh, this is about uh, attrition. It's about who can stay in there for the long haul and understand that this is going to change two or three times over uh, between now and whenever we select our nominee next year. But it all starts in Iowa. And I want to tell everyone how much I appreciate Iowa, how much I've enjoyed campaigning here. Uh, the people are friendly. Uh, it is so much like my state, Arkansas, simply because uh, if we have a farming community that we have in common, we're an ag state, uh, we're small communities, we have industry that supports those small communities that's so important. People work hard, great ethics, uh, great values, and to me that's Iowa. It's also Arkansas where I was governor for eight years. And so I love the welcome that we've had here in Iowa, and uh, we're working hard. Uh, and I think Iowa is the one that's going to turn this campaign around in terms of uh, setting a new direction for America. Nationally, Donald Trump is about 60% of the polls, which is pretty extraordinary. But in Iowa, it's 43%. Now, you, whenever you look at that, 17% difference. And I think that's because Iowans are thinking about it really hard already and they know what rests on your shoulders. And you say, well, you know, you're low in the polls, well, let me join others that are low in the polls, uh, because that's not unusual right here. And just like New Hampshire, I talked to uh, Governor John Sununu there, and I asked his sage political advice, and he said, uh, the Granite State voters will not even start thinking about it until after Thanksgiving. Now, Iowa's a little bit ahead of the game because you're here today, so obviously you're thinking about it. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, going, both states are late deciders. Uh, they're going to change probably one or two times between now and the time of the caucus uh, or the time that they voted in New Hampshire. So this is uh, an unpredictable environment, and I look at it from the long standpoint. I want to be able to do well in Iowa. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to win, that means you have to compete. Uh, and then uh, you have New Hampshire, and then you get to the South. Uh, and in the South, Super Tuesday is where Arkansas votes, uh, Mississippi, Tennessee, Louisiana, the surrounding states. And so I think that's uh, where a strength lies for me, and I want to make sure I can sustain this campaign for that uh, long haul. The other uh, unknown ingredient is what happens to the front run. Now, I supported Donald Trump in 16, I supported him in 20, uh, but this is a different environment uh, in 2024, and uh, he didn't win in 2020, and I don't see that happening again. We have to have a nominee that can bring in independent voters, that can bring in uh, the urban voters, and expand the base of our party, uh, not only that we win the presidency, but that we can also do well in the House and the Senate. And so you've got to think through and analyze all of that. Now, uh, it's fun for me uh, to campaign here in Iowa uh, to meet people like Julie. And uh, what a treat it was for me to be on that plane ride coming in. Things happen, you know, my first trip into Des Moines, you've heard me tell this story that uh, a lady sat beside me and she just simply looked at me and said, you're coming in for 2024, aren't you? And I said, how did you know? And she says, we just know things in <laughs> Iowa. And so you, you do know things here. But uh, that's, that's special to meet people that care 
uh, I was at a uh, lunch group, uh, and I was at a table, and another couple came over and said, Governor, would you mind coming over and sitting at our table for a few minutes? We have questions to ask you. That's Iowa that takes uh, their role seriously. So I love campaigning here, and then Julie's a special part of it as well. Whenever you look at why I'm running for President of the United States, it is very simple. I believe that the Biden administration uh, has taken our country in the wrong direction. If you look at border security, they failed at border security. And it's just amazing to me uh, that he started out by saying, uh, we're not going to do anything on the wall. And by the end of his three years later, he's saying we're going to spend money on the wall again. But he sent such mixed signals that everyone in Latin America sees the United States southern border under the Biden administration as open, and that's why they come. You've got to have a tougher policy. Uh, we've got to make sure that we uh, take the steps necessary to secure that border. Uh, he's failed us in terms of energy policy. Once again, he said, we're going to go all green. That's how he started the administration. We're going to go all green. And then the Ukraine war started. Uh, you saw shortages globally on the oil supply. He goes to Saudi Arabia and says, can you produce more? One of the most embarrassing trips to the United States of America when our president went there and saying, can you produce more oil? And Saudi Arabia said no. And so we cannot be dependent upon other countries that particularly are not our most friendly nations. And we have to be able to produce here in the United States of America. He canceled leases in Alaska. We, I will open those leases up again for production. We're going to rely upon our biofuels production here uh, in Iowa. Uh, that's an important part of the mix. In Arkansas, we have nuclear fuel. We need to be able to produce fuel uh, from a variety of sources, from solar to nuclear to uh, the biofuels to the traditional fossil fuels as well. And I do believe we have to produce it in a way that is most environmentally sensitive, but we need to produce. Uh, and I will do that uh, as President of the United States. Whenever you look at the weakness that President Biden has shown globally, we've paid a tremendous price for that. Uh, his weakness coming out of Afghanistan, uh, the world saw that. Russia became aggressive, moved into Ukraine. China became more aggressive toward Taiwan. We have to be strong and we have to be able to showcase to the world that we're going to be reliable partners with our allies. And I will do that. Uh, I've been blessed. I hope that you all understand this because in Iowa, you look at the Republican candidates and you're going to say, well, they all want to produce more energy. They want to secure the border. Uh, they want to uh, focus on our economy and move toward a balanced budget. So how do you separate the candidates? Look at who has a proven record to doing each of those things and has experience. No one comes to this campaign with the breadth of experience that I have in national security issues, in balancing a budget, uh, in uh, creating jobs from the economic, uh, from the private sector side. I've been blessed to uh, serve not just as governor, but I was a federal prosecutor. Uh, I understand the rule of law. I was in charge of border security in the Bush administration. And we did not get it perfect. I will raise my hand and say I understand that. But it looks perfect compared to what you see in the Biden administration. And I know what needs to be done. I've been down meeting with President Vicente Fox, who was then the president of Mexico. And we built a partnership to go after the Tijuana cartel, and we were successful. You've got to build those partnerships again, and I can do that. Uh, I know how to build the infrastructure, reform the asylum laws. Uh, I know how to uh, make sure the Border Patrol has the resources they need. Whenever you look at the border security, uh, it's amazing to me that Governor Abbott uh, had the initiative to put in water barriers. And maybe they weren't perfect, but to have President Biden sue Governor Abbott and say, you don't have the authority to do that. I would have called in my Border Patrol chief and said, why didn't you think of this? And it's, and it's an example where you can have a partnership with the states versus an adversary relationship. And that's how you protect the border. 
the number one issue next year will be the economy. People are hurting out there. I come across people in the diners that work two jobs. Uh, I ask them, what's the big issue to you? And they say it's, it's inflation and the cost of food for the table. And of course, the Biden administration takes great joy in the fact that the growth of inflation has slowed. Well, think about that for a minute. We've had a 25% growth uh, in the cost of, of groceries, and, our, and now it's all been built into the prices. You don't see them going down, and so the paycheck has been eroded. You get the economy going the right direction by one, sense, sense, one principle, and that is what I did as governor. I want the private sector, the economy, to go faster than the government sector. And whenever you set that as a, a guidepost, that means you're going to control government spending. You're not going to print money that you can't pay for. Uh, you're going to be focused on the private sector and reducing regulations. What does it take for the private sector to create jobs? Less government inter intervention, uh, less uh, you know, on the cost of goods that they have, a fair tax structure. We're going to create jobs here in America. <coughs> The economy is one that we have to lead on. Energy production is a part of that. And then you look, something that's very important to me that will be a focus of mine, and that is simply the rule of law. I want to tell you a story that uh, whenever I was governor, just like everywhere else across the country, you had uh, violence that followed the George Floyd protests after his death. And Arkansas was no exception, and we had uh, the protest, and they turned violent, and uh, our capital was threatened. I watched it on TV. You had buildings being burned, and the individuals that uh, had their life at risk. And our chief of police and mayor was not doing that. And I said, enough is enough. I called in the state police. I called in uh, the National Guard, and I said, let's set up a unified command structure and I want you to go out and arrest people that violate the law. That night we had 70 people arrested. And guess what happened? The violence stopped. Enforcing the law makes a difference. And when you see smash and grab in our inner cities, when you see violence in Washington, D.C., this is not the great country that I want. I want the rule of law respected. And it starts with border security. It starts with enforcement of our laws in our inner cities and making sure we don't have sanctuary cities uh, that uh, lure people in. We don't want to have cities that uh, have no bail requirements that uh, release people. It's amazing to me in Arkansas we have a jail overcrowding problem. But I go uh, to other cities across the country and they say because of bail reform our jails are empty. You know we have a surplus of space and we got it out of whack, and the lack of accountability has encouraged the criminal element. I know how to stop that as a former federal prosecutor. And then, and y'all come on in. I see important people coming in bringing food. Y'all, come on in. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I keep talking a little bit, but you keep doing your business. That's uh, really important. And I'm going to turn it over for questions as you get your food. It'll be a little bit easier for you. Uh, but I want to make a couple of other points, but I mentioned the rule of law after we arrested 70 and stopped the violence of Little Rock. I brought in the young African American leaders that were leading those protests. And they were not part of the violence. They were legitimately concerned about relationships of minority community with police and safety in the community, and that there was not uh, uh, overzealous cops that uh, would use excessive force. I called them in and I, they shared their concerns with me and I asked them, would you be willing to serve on a task force to look at the reform that you're wanting to pursue? And they jumped at me or jumped at the opportunity and said, are you kidding? We would love to do that. And I said, there's one caveat that I want you to serve on this task force with law enforcement leaders. And they said, we'll do that. So I put this task force together, the young protest leaders and law enforcement, they made recommendations that our General Assembly adopted that was some good police reform so that if somebody's fired from one jurisdiction for excessive force, 
they're not hired somewhere else. We're putting it in that database. So they're, they're known. And that's what the young protest leaders wanted. Increased police training. And guess what? Every certified law enforcement officer in the state of Arkansas got a $5,000 bonus. And uh, that, to me, is leadership of enforcing the law, but also bringing people together. And today, in America, we need leaders that know how to bring people together to solve problems. I want a president uh, that can reflect the character of the United States. I want a president that can reflect integrity and does not further the divide in our country, but diminishes the divide. That, to me, is so important. And that's one of the reasons that I'm leading or I'm running for president. I'm a candidate that can have the experience, I can bring people together, I can get things done, and I have the view that America can be strong and good at the same time. And I want the world to see that goodness in America. So those are a couple of thoughts today. You all start eating here, and I want to turn it over for questions uh, that you might have. Yes, sir. I have a couple. Um, it's been kind of on my mind a lot lately. Um, going by the elections over, you know, that just recently happened, it feels like we're, we're losing the, the pro-life messaging. But not only part of that is I, I, I see, uh, I think the, uh, the adoption uh, process needs to be streamlined and make it so not cause uh, for people to adopt, because that, that to me should be part of that overall message. And, and kind of in the same line of thinking, the immigration policy, for people to come here and go through the process, the length of time and the amount of money that they have to put out, it encourages people to come here. And I, and I haven't really heard anybody speak along those two lines. Perfect. Well, there's two separate issues there, so help me remember those. But uh, on the latter one, on the immigration side, first of all, we need to make sure we use the right language. Uh, and you know, we want to secure the border, but we're also a land of immigrants and we need to have a legal path for people to come here. Uh, that's important for our Social Security programs. It's important for making sure we have the workforce that sure. we need. So. I'm unique in the idea that I present, which is a state-based visa program. Right now, uh, we have federal governments responsible for managing immigration, but they delegated to employers an employer-based visa program with limited numbers, but they can bring people in to support their workforce. I want to have a state-based visa program in which we give a state, Iowa, for example, if Governor Reynolds wants to focus on biotech, she can have a state-based visa program for biotech, or maybe it could be agricultural workers that are needed. And so we can give them uh, authority to execute a state-based visa program uh, with the right security parameters. And you say, can a state handle that? Well, I don't think they could mess it up any more than the federal government's messed up visas. And so I think that is a good way to increase or give the opportunity for uh, immigrants to come here to our country to work and, and it fills the needs in states that want to grow and have that kind of workforce. On the first part of the question about the elections this last week, the national media really focuses on that this was a deciding moment uh, on the abortion issue and that was a deciding factor. And certainly, obviously, in Ohio, whenever they did a constitutional amendment. But in Virginia, uh, we had a bad election there in Virginia whenever we lost uh, one, one uh, uh, chamber of the legislature. Uh, the Democrats control both now. And I think it was a combination. Uh, maybe abortion was a factor there. But I believe it was also a lack of confidence in Republican leadership. I see this all the time that people come to me and say, I've always voted Republican. I've been a loyal Republican, but I don't I don't understand where the party is going today and they're frustrated by it, and I think that is a part of reflection of how we did not do well. Uh, one of the things that I did as governor of Arkansas was we, uh, we actually called it the Restore Hope Initiative, in which we focused on increasing our foster care services. Uh, 
we wanted to make sure that our foster parents had the support that they need, and uh, we actually increased uh, their, their reimbursement rates. And that leads to adoption, because generally in an adoption, when somebody is born uh, in a home that they want to uh, not have the child, then it might go into foster care, and then it goes into adoption services. It could go directly, but you're absolutely correct. These are challenging pregnancies that people are struggling with, and they want to see a full life support where we support maternal health care, we support the prenatal care, we support the year after birth to make sure they have, the child has the care that they need, and to increase the adoption alternatives. We have to have a full coverage for the challenges uh, for, those, for those pregnancies. Yes, ma'am. Julie. Um, one of my big concerns or things I am passionate about is family and children and, and schooling and such. And I know there's just, I feel like there's a lot of overreach in schools and taking over the parents' role. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that and how we can come I, Yes. And, uh, he started off with, with children, I just want to remark, but my wife Susan, who is First Lady of Arkansas, she had as her uh, initiative uh, supporting our children advocacy centers, and she's just done a remarkable job. She continues to support those children that have suffered abuse and make sure they have the support that they need and services that they need. But you're speaking of really the schools. And this administration has driven a leftist social agenda that has worked its way down through our schools. And the most important thing that I can do as president is to stop the federal government from pushing that leftist social policy. I mean, I, as governor, uh, it was during the Obama administration, but they sent out a notice from uh, the Department of Education, their Civil Rights Division, to all the superintendents directly and said, you need to have uh, transgender bathrooms. You need to open them up to whatever gender the child decides they are that day. And I looked at that and I sent out a public notice saying all of our school superintendents can ignore this guidance. It is wrong legally. Uh, it is wrong from a common sense standpoint. And it's something our local school boards can address in those most sensitive areas. And you don't need it coming from Washington. And that's what my job as president is, to get the federal government out of trying to shape uh, the values in our community that are contrary to what the citizens want in that community. And uh, I want our values shaped by our churches, our people of faith, our individuals, our homes, uh, and our local school boards. And uh, they're capable of doing that. And so get the federal government out. You know, the same thing. I don't want the federal government pushing any social agenda, right or left. That's determined by the values that we have in our communities. And so that's what you can see for me. You know, as a parent uh, and grandparent, uh, I want uh, our schools to reflect the values of the community. Uh, I don't want them to be pushing that agenda. And uh, that's why we have choice in education. I support choice in education. Uh, you know, I talked to some of my public career, uh, but, you know, I've also started a Christian school. I've, you know, our, our children went to public school, private school, because every child needs something different, and we actually homeschool as well. That's choice of education. Today it's elevated to a new level where there's actually taxpayer dollars that can help parents have those choices, and I support that choice too. Yes. Governor Hutchinson, first, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I'm wondering what you feel about um, balancing our budget, if you feel that's important at the federal level. I think there's a lot of people on both the right and the left that are concerned about spending um, and where our federal government is going, particularly the last several years, in being fiscally uh, responsible. And you feel like we should have, you know, from a philosophical perspective, a balanced budget um, at the federal level and try to get, get back there? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, the answer is yes. And uh, 
this is the root cause of our economic problems. You think about how much money we've spent in Ukraine. It's like $100 billion of military equipment that we've provided to them. And aid, $100 billion. And contrast that to what we spent domestically in one spending bill uh, called the Inflation Reduction Act. It was over $1.2 trillion, and that cost was underestimated. That flooded our economy with too much money that adds to our debt. It's printed money. And that is the root cause of inflation and the high interest rates that we have. So what do you do about it? You've got to move toward a balanced budget. I did that eight years as governor. It's more difficult in Washington. But uh, at, when I was in Congress, it's the last time we balanced the budget in our country. Uh, Bill Clinton and then George W. Bush was president. Uh, I was in Congress, Newt Gingrich was speaker, and we worked together to slow the growth of spending and to balance our budget. We did it. Today, it is an enormous challenge. And so I would be supportive of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Now, that's not the tool we always want to resort to, but we are in dire circumstances economically, and that kind of heavy-handed tool is needed. You can't wait on that because it takes a long time to get a, an amendment through the on our Constitution. So I would start immediately on day one doing a couple things. One, uh, I would uh, put in a hiring freeze with the goal being to reduce non-defense federal workforce by 200,000 workers. That's a 10% reduction. That can be done. It's realistic. I'm not setting a goal. Well, that's crazy. Uh, one candidate said we're going to reduce it by 75%. That can't happen if you're going to secure the border. can't happen if you're going to have safe airplanes. But I can do it through management of a 200,000 reduction. That's a good start to balancing the budget. Whenever you look at uh, Congress, the President has not submitted his budget on, in a timely fashion to Congress so they can start doing their appropriation work. I would do it on time, and then I would veto bills that were excessive spending on Congress's part. Uh, those are start of what has to be done. Uh, it does take uh, presidential leadership to get it done. It does make a difference whether we have a Republican or a Democrat Congress, uh, but both of them spend too much money, and we've got to change that culture. In Arkansas, I reduced state employment by 3,000 workers from over eight years, 3,000 fewer workers in state government. And I did that uh, by attrition and not replacing them whenever we could do it in a different way. We can do that in Washington as well. Good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ask your question. But, um, the, yeah. the foreign army is trying to, um, like, this, they're trying to destroy China. Because the science is actually, actually just destroying buildings. I mean, all right, so help me out, Dad. He's worried about China. Yeah, I heard China, so let me just address it from that standpoint. Good question. Very good question that you asked. And uh, China is our number one economic competitor, and they have become a security adversary whenever they have their friends as uh, Russia, uh, and they have their friends uh, uh, that, like Iran. Or North Korea and so uh, we have to understand the threat that they bring and so I support the freedom of Taiwan I don't believe it's inevitable that China uh, is going to invade Taiwan but we have to show strength and that's why I would rebuild the, uh, the bases that we have in the Philippines so that we can have the right personnel the right ships there to deter that aggressive action by China one thing I'll say very specifically about China. Right now, whenever you look at our military parts and our ammunition that we need uh, to supply Israel or Ukraine or ourselves, we're dependent upon China for our power. I would invoke the Defense Production Act to move uh, military production from China back to the United States of America. Uh, the Defense Production Act is a tool that can be used when there's a national security issue. It was invoked uh, 
uh, by uh, President Trump in a limited way and President Biden whenever we were producing the vaccines, when we were producing PPE, we have to use the Defense Production Act for what it was intended for, which is military production. I would use that. I'm only candidates have talked about that issue. But that's how I would address moving so the manufacturing back from China uh, to the United States. Thank you. You're welcome. You want to see? <laughs> yeah, good. Please, good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's so, good. a bit of a drive. I apologize. Tell your name. Could we talk? Oh, I'm Joel uh, Bowen Betts. Yes, yes. Thank you for yeah. being here. Thank you. Legally. Say play in. Legally, of course. So, you can bring that. You like salmon? Pardon? Do you like salmon? I um, have a salmon right now, plate I for you. I think I need to take it down a little bit, but thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, um, I know it sounds like a strong military is an important part of your, your plan. Um, so, a lot of the military branches are having trouble getting young men to uh, join the military. They don't see the benefits of it. What, what are your thoughts on this? Um, Maybe increasing the incentive. I meant, you know, yeah. some of the branches are having trouble filling the spots that they would need to have a good defense. So there's a number of things that need to be done there, and you're right. Uh, right now, the military recruitment for our armed services has Wait. fallen short. Yes. I think the Marines are the only one that are meeting their recruitment goals. Yes. Everybody so else is falling short. So, yeah. And uh, that says something about the Marines. And, and I think the answer is that people see the Marines as a, as a fighting unit, as one that uh, has always been there for our country, and that they're highly regarded. And to me, that's the first thing a president needs to do, is to make it clear to our military and our leadership that we support you, uh, you're important to our country and our freedoms, we respect you, we, and uh, you're, you're a big part of our of what we do as a country. And so value in the military is critical. And you've got to contrast with some of the things that have been said about our military in the past, uh, about we don't like wounded soldiers, uh, we don't want them uh, in a parade. I mean, these are ridiculous things that have been said, and that hurts our military. Whenever our United States Senate is not approving promotions for our military, it hurts the morale right there. And so that has to change. Uh, but it's also important that uh, we pay them adequately. Now, we're paying them, so if a single guy is in the military or girl, uh, that uh, they have adequate pay. But how about a family, in which the family right now might be qualifying for food stamps? We've got to make sure that our family military units are taken care of as well. And then it's about they're war fighters, and, and they have to be trained appropriately, and we don't want a woke ideology floating through our military that takes them away from the mission that they, and the training that they have that's important to them. So the, to me, those are all elements that has slowed us down in our recruitment, and that can be reversed by the right leadership uh, in the White House. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I have respected you for a long time and was uh, very happy to see that you're home. I'm one of those people who would be um, considerate, probably a moderate, a uh, humanist, but at the same time conservative when it comes to both international and also finance. I'm a former securities lawyer, basically, did bond work and prosecuted in Chicago. Um, what I'm finding now is that when I talk to um, specifically women, good example, who are concerned about um, the direction that the party is headed, um, that, and I would just say, in that, is that they don't know enough about you and that they're simultaneously uncomfortable with the Chris Christie. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm going to them because I'm concerned about some of, the, some of the things that are being said about going after people, about uh, fraudulent people, about going after them, doing things that, that indicate that we're heading in a direction that, that to me, is dangerous. Um, the the um, 
what what I would like what I would so much like you to address is and also I think this would make a difference in fundraising actually um, is address sort of two pieces I have. I have more than that up to tell from my notes. My poor husband was taking notes as I was driving. Um, he has Alzheimer's and, and can't drive. So he, but he's a patient loving individual. You know, I'm concerned about what we're going to get if we head toward the kind of lack of respect for the Constitution. Um, and also, I'm, I'm concerned that people don't have a chance to think about whether it will matter if someone is in the position of power who will overuse it. Um, I, I would very much like to hear from you, because my reaction to you is, and from what I've seen, and it's been a long, actually, I've paid attention for a long time. There are a few governors I have a lot of respect for. You're one of them. Um, I, I wonder what it is right now, and I think it would affect Slenderick substantially, that you are willing to say, in a, in a way that is not, will not, shall we say, um, uh, inculcate fear of you, and at the same time, show people the strength that you have. Because I think that's something that you do have. I, I prosecuted security squad for 12 years, and then did enough so that I had to deal with pretty smart people that was in enforcement, um, but have a sense of where they were going, where they were crossing the line. Let, there let, it is, crossing the line. Let, let, let me jump in there, ahead, and, sure. and you can follow sure. up, but I'll, I'll comment uh, on a number of things that you've said. Uh, first of all, that's my biggest challenge, is I need people to know me. I need to expose myself. I want people to understand my record as a, as a governor, my experience in the national security arena. You mentioned uh, uh, prosecuting cases. Uh, you know, I have a, a, I have a medal about me uh, because I've dealt with uh, challenges in times of crisis, whether it's an armed standoff with a terrorist group that I handled as a U.S. attorney or whether it's post 9-11 environment. Uh, where uh, I had to deal with the national security issues protecting our country from a terrorist attack. I've been in times of crisis, and I want people to understand that, but also want them to understand who I am. You mentioned, uh, which goes to my respect for the rule of law, uh, one of my priorities, and I don't want the, the uh, justice system in America politicized. Uh, I don't want it weaponized, as we say, uh, where it's used by uh, the left to go after the right, but at the same time, uh, I don't want our next president to say we're going to use our Justice Department to get even with our political enemies, and that has already been said. It is wrong. Uh, we don't need a president that's motivated by revenge. Uh, we don't. These, these are challenging times for America, and we need to focus on the common good and not our personal agendas. And uh, that's where I'll bring reform to our justice system in America. We have 90 law enforcement offices, 90 federal law enforcement agencies, 90, with gun-toting authority and arrest authority. There are overlapping jurisdictions. I will initiate reform. I will initiate a charter for each of those in which they will be able to say in the charter, we're going to protect civil liberties and we're not going to go after people because they're political voices. That's the kind of reform that I'm bringing. But today, we need people to stand up with courage and to say exactly what I did. And I was the only one clearly on the debate stage in the first debate, national audience, in which uh, I would, we were asked the questions, how many of you would support Donald Trump if he was a convicted felon? And uh, a few of them looked around, raised their hand, and uh, Chris Christie got his halfway up. Uh, but I was clear that uh, that's not going to happen. And so I do take a stand, and it's clear on that. You mentioned Chris Christie, who I have a lot of uh, admiration for. He's been an important voice. But I, I say that uh, I present this with a little Southern gentility. 
Uh, he has a little bit of a New Jersey uh, background uh, and heavy hand in it. So there is a contrast there between us. And I want to be able to be clear on my views in support for the rule of law and accountability. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to be in a position to bring people together. After the primary, we need to reach out uh, to those uh, Trump voters that if he doesn't succeed, that we can win them on our side. And it's through uh, addressing the issues, accountability, the rule of law, and respect for it. That, to me, is what a Republican is. And that's a history that we brought to the table. Now, did you... Did I cover part of it? It's wonderful. I mean, what you have to say is why I wanted you in the past. I, I, um, I, I think one of the concerns I have is that people don't realize that it will matter. That what is being said is what it will be done. And, you know, um, and, and I do also think that in terms of even in terms of fundraising, that there are, you know, I'm 77, and so there's sort of a, a peer group I have, although I don't have the money that some of my friends have. Um, I, I, to be able to actually pierce through The Apprentice, I watched it all the time. I was really just fascinated by that. So I'm convinced that that is the Thing that has moved uh, Trump more than people even well, realize. It's, it's entertainment value. Uh, it's different. He was both the boss. And they, they're attracted to that. But to your point, uh, people, there's only so much a candidate can do, and people have to understand and think through what's at stake and what it means uh, as to the decision they make on who the nominee is going to be. I'm confident. Uh, you, you, before you came, I mentioned that uh, in Iowa, Donald Trump's at 43%. 57% say that we need to have a different option that's out there. Now, that's a better than uh, nationally, and it's because Iowa's starting to focus on it. And so there, it is not inevitable. Uh, it can change, and it's going to be up to the voters, but I believe that as we get into the Ides of March next year, that they're going to see what's at stake, and those numbers will change. Uh, Good. So, then I more questions. I want to come back to you, sir, because yes. I answered it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we should address what you raised on abortion and on adoption. Well, the other, let me speak to the other one first, the, the uh, <coughs> attaining uh, citizenship in this country. A place I work here in Ames has a multi-diversified uh, group. And I know personally, um, at least I have a dozen people <clears throat> that have obtained citizenship in the last four or five years. And it just dropped my jaw on how much it costs them to go through the whole process legally. Yeah, yeah. And not everybody is going to have those type of funds available to them. And <clears throat> that, that even a person that might not just want to be coming here to uh, just load up on our benefits, you know, through a legal process. They may be bringing some skills to the, the table that can actually, you know, uh, affect our community from a productivity standpoint. And yet, because of the system is so bogged down with red tape and, and money, and it takes forever, um, that's concerning to me. That we won't, that we need to fix that somehow. It shouldn't have to take that long. Nothing should ever have to take that long. But every time government gets their hand in it, it, it just the monster grows. You know, the bureaucracy grows. Yeah. And everybody's got to get a piece of the action. And that's got to be curtailed. We need to simplify the process for the legal path. Now, we also, and, and I've been there and I understand this, that uh, there is an unending number of people that want to come to the United States of America. And that's a good thing. They really want to come here. You think about what they're doing uh, from Venezuela, going through the Darien Gap and great risk themselves and trekking from South America through Central America and through Mexico and have to deal with the cartels and the threats in their lives. They want to get here. And so uh, 
And if you set up a legal path, I mean, the Philippines are a good example. You know, there's a seven-year waiting list to come in the United States legally from the Philippines. Well, pardon? I think Mexico also. Yeah, there, I mean, and, and, and if you said we're going to speed this up so we can process it within one year, well, it will be back up to a seven-year waiting list already because people want to get here that bad. So, you know, we that is a wonderful thing for our country, but we've got to we've got to balance uh, uh, having a legal path here and also recognizing you know we've got to be able to control the workforce and how many come here. Well, I mean, you have to set some type of quotas. I mean, yeah, it, 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 it's it's all um, being targeted like we're against people, but. We look back at, at the turn of the century. You know, we had to set quotas, and we couldn't just have it. Open. Sure, everybody walk in here. And the other thing that they did was, they, you know, they tested people for diseases. Because yeah. I mean, there's elements of diseases that we've had eradicated in this country. They're coming in now because we don't know who the heck's coming in. Yep. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a mess. And in the regards to you know, um, adoption, again, I know, I know some, you know, a lot of young people that right now they they can't conceive. And they're like anything better than to adopt, but they don't have necessarily the funds. And they would give a, a, a child a, a good, loving home, and they can afford, you know, to, to have a child. But the, the paperwork and the, the amount of money goes through that is that's well, reasonable too. Exactly, and you know, our faith-based organizations can do a lot to support uh, those families that are going through adoption and make sure that uh, the needs are covered there. Secondly, we need to have a good adoption credit to make sure that they uh, have a break if they're doing an adoption. Uh, so there are some things that can be done there. I know that uh, we got some, a lot of working folks here. Uh, I'll be around here to answer questions, but let me just say, one, we want to make sure we get uh, your name down here so that if we come to your community, we'll have your email, we can let you know. Uh, that's really beneficial to us. To your point, uh, if you go to asa2024.com, and uh, that little card there, can, you know, QR code can take you there. Uh, help us get on the next debate stage. Help us to you know, donate. Help us to make sure. I want to be on TV. We got a great ad that's produced. I want to be able to, uh, uh, you know, next January through the 15th, I want to be on TV uh, here in Iowa and in New Hampshire. So uh, your contributions helps us in that way. And just spread the word. Uh, you know, we want people uh, you know, committed to us for the caucus. We need people that will go to the caucus and say, "On oh, caucus for Asa Hutchinson." Uh, so help us in all of that. Taylor Maddox is here, who's my Iowa field director, and uh, Tim Coonan uh, is my state chairman. Uh, and we're growing in support here. Uh, but you know, I think about it with our kind of campaign, which is retail. It is here, meeting with people. Uh, I need more time. And so we've only got, we got less than 60 days now for the caucus. And so we got to use every minute of that uh, to maximize my exposure. Uh, I'm going to be going down to Grinnell a little bit later. We're going to have a great event down there. But I'll be coming back uh, the week after Thanksgiving. And so we want to line up some events then. So in your community, if you want to have us, uh, meet and greet, luncheon, or coffee, uh, let us know. We want to come to your community. Any final thoughts? Well, the same one I talked to you about, but I talked to you about like your thoughts on the Israeli conflict. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, keep working. We believe in work in America. Uh, I just want well, a question on uh, Israel, which is critically important today. First of all, we've got to back Israel uh, unequivocally. And I disagree with this administration that is pushing for a ceasefire or those on college campuses that are pushing for a ceasefire. I think Israel has demonstrated that as they go into Gaza, that uh, they were right, uh, that the uh, hospital is, has to be taken care of in a humanitarian way, and the patients there. But Hamas has used uh, those kind of protected environments as shields. And so they have to go in there, and that puts the civilian population at risk. Uh, we need to support the civilian population that are trying to get out safely, uh, but we have to support Israel in eliminating Hamas. That is the most important thing. We need to work to try to avoid a, a broader regional war. And it was really, 
and this administration has done some good things in their shuttle diplomacy to Egypt and, and to uh, try to communicate with the UAE and to Jordan to keep them out of uh, the, uh, the fight. Uh, and so far that's been effective. I think the final thing is Iran, uh, with our, the attacks on our soldiers and uh, installations in Syria, we have to be fully understanding the threat that Iran brings. And we're going to have to increase our sanctions. We're going to have to uh, work hard to keep them from supporting the terrorism over the long term, which they're doing right now. And of course, finally, it reminds me of the 9-11 post-environment where I had to protect our country from a terrorist attack. We did it successfully, but we have the same threats today. And uh, we need to be mindful of that. Support Israel. All right. Thank you all. Uh, you all give me a lot of time today, and we'll visit some more. I want to thank our distinguished members of the media for being here today. Give them a round of applause. Don't you don't have to You won't hear that at every round. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
not how I do it. Thanks for coming out. There'll be another time. Oh, she's going to be there. There you go. You got that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.